I think that the woman behind the counter misunderstood what I said because she now thinks that I'm actually friends with Anne Lamont. <laughs> You're going to get great service. <laughs> hey, readers, I'm Ann Bogle, and this is What Should I Read Next, episode 281. Welcome to the show that's dedicated to answering the question that plagues every reader. What should I read next? We don't get bossy on the show. What we will do here is give you the information you need to choose your next read. Every week, we'll talk all things books and reading and do a little literary matchmaking with one guest. Today's guest adores a genre we don't often hear about on the podcast. Lecturer, author, and researcher Heather Williams has left trails of books across the globe as she travels for work. But today, she's bringing us three favorite essay collections she can't live without. Heather's love of bite-sized reading experiences is contagious. If you've never picked up an essay collection, she just might convince you to do so today. We also discuss her preference for reliable narrators, a surprising fascination with Russian literature, and a book that made Heather laugh a little too loudly while reading on a plane. I happen to love personal essays just as much as Heather, and I can't wait for you to listen in on our conversation. Let's get to it. Heather, welcome to the show. Hi, Anne. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really excited to talk to you. Tell me a little bit about yourself. I am a lecturer, which is kind of the same as an assistant professor, and I normally work at a university in London, but this year I'm visiting a university in the Boston, Cambridge area. Uh, I'll, I'll just jump right into it what I work on. Uh, <laughs> so there's no avoiding it. Uh, so my research is actually on nuclear weapons, uh, which might be a little bit different. I, th- I think that's a what should I read next first? Is it? Oh, I'm honored. <laughs> Um, Just to be clear, I don't make them. I don't explode them. That is not what my research is about. I'm um, most of my research and what I write about is more how do we control these weapons? How do we make sure that they never go off? Um, And so I I hope that I'm on um, the better side of of, uh, all the nuclear weapons issues. I I lived in uh, in the UK, in London, for about 10 years. Before that, I had been in Washington, D.C. I had been in Boston before, and I'm originally from really far upstate New York near the Adirondack Mountains. So I I think I've been bouncing around a lot, which has been a problem for carrying all my books. Oh, goodness. Where are your books in the world right now? I refer to them as my book crumbs because I've left little trails everywhere that (laughs) I've been. There are about probably 20 boxes at my parents' house in New York. In the attic there, there are, I think, 10 boxes at my in-laws in Ireland. There are some boxes in my old office in Washington. I think boxes in two places in London. And then a few others that I've just left with friends along the way. So at some point, um, I really need to bring them all together. But, you know, I've really tried the, the e-reader. And it's, it's just not for me, even though it would make my life so much easier. It does sound like you have the beginning of a novel there. Surely somebody could turn that into a story. A woman travels the world recovering the books that she littered across the globe in her past. Oh, I that sounds that. fun. That sounds really fun. I should, uh, I should uh, set that up and give up this whole nuclear weapons thing. <laughs> now, tell me, how does one get into that? For me, it really started with Russia. Um, I actually blame books. I specifically oh, blame... Of course. Of course you do. <laughs> yeah. Um, I particularly blame Russian novels here um, at a pretty young age, a family member gave me a copy of Dr. Zhivago, and I was just hooked. I was hooked on the classics. I was hooked on Russian literature. I went to college as a Russian studies major, and I thought I would, you know, become a Russian translator or that I would do all this research on Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. And then I, I literally took one class as an elective on nuclear weapons. And I was like, no, this is, this is a little bit more interesting than War and Peace. And, um, but it really did all start with, uh, with books. Yeah, Dr. Jivago and War and Peace. <laughs> what did they say in the nuclear weapons class that made you think, oh, yeah, this is it? The thing that really attracted me to it was you're trying to th- figure out how other people think. I think there's this stereotype of nuclear weapons. It's all about the science and it's about blowing things up. Obviously, that is part of it. But a lot of what I work on is more about how do you promote cooperation to reduce the nuclear weapons. And I just really like that you have to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. You have to think about 
Why does Russia want to have this certain type of weapon? Why is China building this missile system? And it just forces you to kind of see the world from a different perspective, albeit on a really specific topic around nuclear weapons. But then also the thing that really did draw me to it was the arms control aspect, which is what I work on. And just thinking about, I mean, we have tens of thousands of these weapons. How are we going to get rid of them? How are we going to reduce the numbers? And I just thought it'd be really exciting to be part of the research um, working towards that. Where does reading fit into that life? Reading is essential for this life. (laughs) Day to day, a lot of my job is reading academic articles, academic books, which can sometimes be a little bit dry. They're not always published for their prose or their style. They aren't real page turners most of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And so at the end of the day, reading is just the the best way to relax When I can step away from the really dry stuff, I I would prefer to go for a walk outside, but I'm in Boston and it's freezing cold for six months out of the year. So the best way to relax is just to curl up with a mug of tea and watch the snow. And I really like to read just for the enjoyment of it. I don't put any pressure on my reading life. If I'm not enjoying a book, then I just, I say, okay, I'll just move on, uh, which I know is a little bit blasphemous, but it just helps me to really enjoy it. What do you find yourself drawn to? I used to always want to read, you know, what were the big, um, what were the Booker Prize winners this year? I would get really into my book clubs. I was in a couple of book clubs at one point, but honestly, Anne, I listened to episode 265 with Laura and I had this epiphany about my reading life because she asked these 10 really thoughtful questions to get down to what do you like to read? Why do you read the way you do? And my epiphany was I love essays. I looked through my bookshelf and like half of the books that came to Boston with me. So, and obviously I had to be somewhat selective about what came on the plane, but over half of them were essays. I just really like essays because they're so personal. And when they're done really well, it's like the author reaches through the page and grabs my hand and says, hey, how was your day? Do you want to go for a walk in the woods with me? Do you want to talk about what's going on, you know, with your friends uh, or talking about the news together? And that it just feels really warm and inviting, the essays. Okay, so when we say essay, what kind of works are we talking about? I have a really hard time defining that because it just seems so, so foundational. But how do you describe it? I, I thought about this a lot, actually. And that's the, the greatest thing about essays is that they are so diverse. I think the easiest way to think about them is a collection of short form nonfiction. It can be anything from personal memoir type stories, or it can be um, a discussion about, you know, nature Uh, Mary Oliver wrote this great essay collection, and I read that recently, and it really felt like she had had reached out to me and said, hey, let's go for a walk together. You know, that's just one style, the nature essay. But it can be about politics. It can be about health. It can be about so many different things. But for me, what really defines the essay is that it is bite-sized, so you can usually, or I can Mm. usually read one in one sitting, usually around one or two cups of tea. (laughs) I like that that's the time measurement. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Um, But it's also that there's usually this personal aspect to it. I I feel like the writer breaks that fourth wall, so to speak, and that feeling that they've reached across and that they're trying to to speak to you really directly. And that's what I think sets essays apart. One thing I think makes essays so great right now is that we are in this pandemic. We aren't having the same social interactions. I mean, I haven't met many new people (laughs) over the past year. Mm -hmm. But with essays, you do feel like you're getting to really know this person if the writer is, you know, generous and honest in their writing. Do you remember the essay that first hooked you on the form? I also really enjoy a good personal essay. I remember reading, it was Annie Dillard. Is that a huge (sighs) cliche? No, I think that's wonderful. Well, I was in high school. I had a great teacher my senior year, so that was wonderful. But it was Annie Dillard's essay. I think it's called The Death of the Moth, The Death of a Moth. But it's mm-hmm. it's about she's watching a moth fly into a candle while she's in the woods. I think she's in the woods 
to research Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. I remember reading it going, this isn't exactly a story, but it's not, it's not instructive. And I just, I didn't know you could write like that. And it just opened this whole world of possibility for what I could read and what I could write. Then I went on to read The Writing Life, her longer book. From that point on, I keep an eye out for essays, whether they were in the newspaper or a magazine or pretty soon the internet or those, you know, best American essays of 2021 collections. So can I ask you, what was it about that first essay that hooked you? Why do you remember that one and that place where you were at when you read it so much? Like what made it special? I think I didn't know you could write like that because what she was doing was observing why these bugs. And I would tell you, I don't want to read about bugs. I don't care about bugs. But something I love about an essay is an author can go, wait, hold, hold on. Let me show you why you why you do. You do care. You just don't know it yet. Yes. Because like you said, essays are so diverse. You can write about anything and make it matter to someone who thought, I just, that's the last thing I want to read about. And I feel like the essayist is like, eh. well, actually. So I really appreciated that aspect of it. And I know in my, my mind, I've kind of collated uh, what she later writes about the moth in the writing life with the first time she observes this moth flying into a candle when she's in the Blue Ridge Mountains. But the way she could write about this thing that isn't about the thing she's actually talking about at all and yet make it essential to the thing. I think I really admire when anyone can draw unexpected connections between two things that are seemingly dissimilar. That's exactly what a good essayist does. Yeah, I think especially if they can draw a connection that feels personal to to the reader as well. You know, for them as a writer, they're obviously speaking to their personal experiences and drawing those connections. But to be able to share that and to um, have the reader feel something similar, it almost feels magical in some ways because you're creating something that really, it transcends time, it transcends space. The essay that really hooked me, and I remember exactly where I was when I read it, was from A Gift from the Sea by Anne Morrow Lindbergh. And it was her essay about the mollusk. And so there are, I think it's six essays in that book. And each one is about a different type of shell that she finds at the beach. And each one is about, you know, a different stage in her life. Again, it's like you said, it's drawing these connections that might not seem obvious But I remember when I was reading, I think it was the mollusk essay, and it was like, that's exactly where I'm at. And I I just felt, I don't don't know how to put it, I felt seen. I have this habit, I think I started it with her, where I'll start referring to my favorite writers by their first names, as if I know these people, (laughs) you know, as if they're still alive in some cases. But after I read that, I remember I tried to give this book to every single one of my friends. And I just said, oh, Anne just has the greatest advice. You're going to love this book. She's, she can hang out with us. I think my friends didn't really get it as much as I did. But that was, that was the book that really got me into, into essays. Reading that, you could be like, okay, really? Like, how is my life like a moon shell? I am not sold. And then she'll lay it out for you. She does. And she creates this environment where you feel like you're just hanging out on the beach with her. Part of the reason that book was special to me um, is, you know, my mother gave it to me and she and I still talk about this book and how much it meant to both. It means to both of us. And so I think when you're gifting books, a lot of it depends on who was giving it, what was, you know, their intention and and how did that speak to you at that time in your life? Now, I find it interesting that you didn't realize your preference for the genre until you were called to, I'm imagining you just taking a look around the room and going, what's here? It seems so obvious. It's one of those things where as soon as I saw it, I couldn't unsee it and thought, how did I not realize this sooner? But I think part of it is because I think the essay gets a bad rap. It is often, you know, the essay section in bookstores, it's often shoved in the back corner and it's a mix together with the philosophy and the poetry section. And a lot of the times, I, I think essays are sometimes seen as being too highbrow. I don't want to read about politics or religion. We shouldn't be talking about those things. But I've heard people say that. And so I think that essays just get pushed aside, and pe- especially for people who prefer fiction. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I get that. And so I think that that was part of the reason that it didn't become obvious to me. Before that, I had thought, oh, I really like memoir, literary nonfiction. You know, essays are all of those things. 
you could even make the case that sometimes short stories are like essays as well, because a lot of times short stories might have that autobiographical component to it. And they're also they're also bite sized and they fit into my time metric of two cups of tea. (laughs) Did you measure like that before you moved to London? Oh, goodness, no. I mean, I was always a coffee drinker, but in the UK, especially because my, my husband's Irish and I think they're even bigger tea drinkers than than the Brits are. So it just became the standard beverage of choice. Oh, well, Heather, I can't wait to hear more. And I imagine we'll get a little more into the details when we discuss your books. Are you ready to do that? Yeah, great. Okay. Well, you know how this works. You're going to tell me three books you love, one book you don't, and what you've been reading lately. And we'll talk about what you may enjoy reading next. Now, how did you choose these? I knew I wanted to pick essays because I had had this epiphany. And so I did try to pick three different types of essay collections. Oh. I also picked them based on what are the ones that I keep going back to and what are the books that made it with me across the Atlantic. As I said, I had to be <laughs> really discerning about what went into, I had a mm-hmm. book suitcase that came onto the plane with me. So I had to be really careful about which ones I, I brought. But these are just the three that whatever mood I'm in, one of them will have the answer. And they're just really enjoyable. How long are you in the U.S. for? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so, I, what I really want to know is how long, what is the period of time for which you could not live without these books? Oh, what a great question. Um, one of them... I probably couldn't go a month without and it'll become clear which one it is because I actually use it a lot in my, in my work because so much of my job is about writing and I write in really different styles. So someday I might write, you know, an 800 word blog post, but then I'm also working on an 80,000 word book. And one of these books, uh, anytime I'm stuck in my writing process, I go to that, she gives me a good laugh, and then she also, the book also tells me exactly what I need to hear and what I need to do next. So to write about nuclear weapons. Okay. I'm I'm fascinated. <laughs> I'm intrigued. Well, I can't wait to hear. Heather, what did you choose for book one? My first book is Trick Mirror by Gia Tolentino. This is one of those essay collections that is about so many different things, but it tells that story and draws that connection that you were talking about, Anne. The author, she's also a writer for The New Yorker, but she and I are around the same age, which is where I often get put into the millennial basket, but I think I'm a little bit too old to be a millennial. And she talks a bit about that, where a lot of her essays are about the internet And if if you're of that age where you can remember what life was like before the internet, she talks about her first blog and her first username and how this was just such an exciting event at the time. But then you had to sit and wait for the internet connection to come through, which I'm guessing anyone over 30 remembers that sound and the anticipation of it. And so a lot of her essays are just about how we use technology. It's about how technology and the internet really shape our life and the way that we interact with each other, which is even more relevant now, obviously, with the pandemic. But um, one of her essays was just my favorite. So she was a contestant on a reality TV show when she was in high school, and she was a high school cheerleader in Texas, then went on this reality show, which was in, it was was somewhere in the Caribbean, and it was a group of boys and girls that had to compete against each other. And so this is a format that probably anyone's familiar with who's seen reality TV, but she provides this like insider's look and insider experience about what is actually going on in reality TV. I mean, this was probably 20 years ago and things will have changed, but then she does this really cool thing where she tracks all of the people who were on that show with her and she finds out who's doing what now. And some of them she even meets up with And she'll talk about, you know, how the show affected them and how um, her life has changed because of it. Some of the essays are these social commentaries about the Internet. I wouldn't call them highbrow. They're really very readable. But then other essays are just these really personal stories about these very unique experiences that she's had. And she's just really forthcoming about what she thought about them. One of the things that I love about these essays is she doesn't claim to have all the answers. She isn't 
saying this is, you know, technology is good or technology is bad. She just raises these questions about how are we using the internet? What does it mean for how we're interacting? Here's how I'm thinking about it. And a lot of the essays, I found myself just kind of slowing down and thinking, huh, that's such a great question. I don't think about this that often. I really like those types of essays that just make you take a beat, think about how you're living and the choices that you're making. And I I particularly like it when the author isn't preaching and telling me what I should be doing. I haven't read this. That sounds fascinating and timely. And also, I definitely remember what that internet, you're waiting for it to connect sound sounds like. Right. It's, It's just a great set of essays. And one of my friends actually had recommended it to me. And she's she's quite a bit younger. She's probably maybe 10 years younger. And she recommended it as this is the millennial book. This is the book for those of us who are trying to navigate, you know, a very different world. And I I just loved it. Um, I also just think that the title is really clever because in a lot of ways, the book itself is holding up a mirror to the reader and saying, this is how you're living in your life on the internet. But then when you think, oh, wait, is this a trick mirror? Is the internet the trick mirror? It, it's just like kind of playing with you a little bit. But it's all, I think, just the writer, Gia Tolentino, her voice kind of coming through. And I, I just loved this book. Well, that's a solid start. What did you choose for your next book? I've got to be honest. I, I know that I had to pick three favorites. This is the one that's really, really my favorite. <laughs> We appreciate your honesty. You put me on a desert island. This would be the one that I brought with me. Um, And so this is Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. Anne Lamott in general, I just really appreciate and love all of her writing. This book in particular, it's about writing. But you don't have to be a writer to get something out of this book or to enjoy it. I think anybody who wants to be creative... Uh, would really get something out of out of her writing. She's from California, so a lot of her writing is about California and nature as well. So again, it's how essays can just bring together all these different aspects. One of the things I love about it, I really do love the writing advice. This is uh, a book that I use almost probably at least once a week. I go and look at this. If I'm stuck in my own writing and I need something to kind of get me going a little bit, she just always seems to have a piece of advice. I have post-it notes all around my desk with her different pieces of advice so I don't have to keep going back to the book because the book has gotten really beat up by now. But the other thing that I just really like about her writing is she's so generous with herself. She's incredibly honest. She is upfront about her imperfections. There's a whole chapter about being jealous of other authors, which I just found really refreshing. And so in addition to this really practical advice that she's giving, you also feel like this is a really honest person. She's another author who I have been known to refer to by her first name. And I'm, I'm stuck <laughs> on this chapter. I don't know what I should write. And she will have the answer. I was recently in my local bookshop and I was buying her new book and the woman behind the counter was saying, oh, don't you just love Anne Lamott? And I said, yeah, it's like, uh, I said, she's like a friend. I think that the woman behind the counter misunderstood what I said because she now thinks that I'm actually friends with Anne Lamott. (laughs) You're going to get great service. Yeah, I, she actually said, oh my gosh, we'll tell her that we love her books. And I was, and I didn't know how to correct her and to say, no, 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 I, I don't actually know her. I just think of her as a, fr- as a friend, but that ship had sailed. Okay, so that was your favorite, favorite, favorite. What did you choose to round out your, <laughs> I'm imagining like the staggered Olympic pedestal. This is not the Olympics. Okay, you know what? <laughs> just, <laughs> Heather, just tell me about a book you love. <laughs> The third book that I love is Me Talk Pretty One Day by David Sedaris. This is just the most fun book. I think anything that he writes is hilarious. Laugh out loud, funny. Make sure that you're not reading it on a red-eye flight because you might laugh really hard and wake up everybody around you, which I have done. (laughs) 
it's another essay collection, but these are really different from the other two books. They're mostly essays about his family. Some of them are just about his everyday life, but that's his real skill. He will take the everyday, seemingly mundane and turn it into something that is just rip-roaringly hilarious. Uh, One of my favorite essays in this was about um, his, his parents got a huge dog, a Great Dane. And it's really hard. This is why it's hard to sell essays because it's like, okay, that's a great story, Heather, his parents got a dog. But it's one of the funniest things that I've ever read and I'm laughing as I'm trying to describe it, um, that he just has this way of telling a story and bringing you into it. I recently gave this book to my husband who doesn't usually read essays. He is much more of a cookbook or fiction reader. I think within 10 minutes of opening it, he was just, you know, keeled over. He was laughing so hard. This is one of the great things about essays is how they can, I think, take you out of your own environment. It's somebody, again, being really personal and sharing themselves with you. Some of these stories... I can't believe his family let him tell some of them. (laughs) I recently watched his master class, actually, and that was one of the things he talked about. Oh, I didn't know about that. Oh, it's really good. Um, (laughs) I I think you have to have read some of his stuff um, because my husband watched it before he had read any of the books. And and I was just laughing. And my husband was like, this isn't funny. And I'm like, you have to read the rooster story. It's great. But again, like he just really opens himself up. But he's also just this incredibly quirky, eccentric character who gets really into taxidermy and he cleans up trash around a small village in uh, the UK, picks up these kind of strange life habits and then tells you about them. And you feel just it just feels like this gift that he shares these stories and you get this look into his life. But I mean, above all, they're just hilarious. I haven't read Me Talk Pretty one day in many, many years. I read it at the beach. Mm -hmm. It was a long time ago. These are the only things I remember, except laughing uproariously. And also some of the humor comes from, I can't believe he just wrote that. When I became a writer and my publisher was like, we need you to get permissions from all these people who you talked about in your book. Uh, Somebody told me about how David Sedaris had said something funny once about like passing around permissions at Thanksgiving dinner. like. (laughs) I said horrible things about you. Would you sign this, please? (laughs) But one of my best listening experiences of 2020 was listening to his new collection, The Best of Me. There's a lot of fiction in there, and I don't love his fiction. How do you feel about his fiction? See, I've never read his fiction. I just keep going straight to the essays. I've never had a lot of luck with audio. Is he good on audiobooks? Oh, my gosh. Yes, he is renowned for being one of the author's whom you should listen to read their own work because he's so, yes, he's so good. And The Best of Me is compilation collection of, you know, his his greatest hits over the years. And some of them are really, really old. The Rooster Story is in there where I'm like crying. I'm laughing so hard thinking this is so, what would my mother think about this essay? Like that's... <laughs> It's so funny. But he tells this funny story about how I write about my family. They didn't sign up for this. That's why I bought them a beach house. (laughs) The rooster story was the one that I was reading on an airplane one time. And I literally woke up three rows of people because I just, (laughs) I had tears streaming down my face. And the person, and the stewardess was like, are you okay? And I just like held up the David Sedaris book. And I was like, I'm fine. I'll just, I'll put the book away and I'll try to sleep. <laughs> but it was, it was the rooster story. It's just, can't explain why it's so funny. He's just talking about his brother's somewhat bizarre <laughs> communication strategy with his father. It's not even a strategy. It's just the way his brother communicates with his father. <laughs> I can't talk about it or I'll start giggling again. (laughs) (laughs) All right. That is quite a um, testimony to David Sedaris. This will calm you down. Well, I don't know if it'll calm you down, but maybe it'll make you stop laughing. Tell me about a book that was not right for you. Or as I think you put it, that was (laughs) deeply disappointing. Calling it deeply disappointing is my best attempt at British understatement. But the book that I found deeply disappointing was... Really, sadly, it was Lincoln and the Bardo by George Saunders. 
I adore George Saunders. I think I have read everything he's ever written in The New Yorker. Uh, I loved the his short story collection, The Tenth of December. But this one just it, it just never came together for me. His short stories feel it always feels like he's pulling you along a little bit. You're going out on a limb, and you're like, I'm really not sure what this is about. I'm not sure where we are going here, but I'll stick with you. And in the short stories, he always pulls it together, often towards the end. But you just, I just always have this light bulb moment when I read his um, short stories or essays. And it's always been worth it for me. When Lincoln and the Bardo came out, to be, I think I might have hyped it up in my own head a little bit too much. Because I was thinking, oh, George, I'm so happy that you've finally done a full-length novel. This is going to be great. But he pulls you out on that limb. The style really confused me. I had a hard time keeping up with which ghost was talking at which point and what were they talking about. And kept waiting for that moment where it all came together. And it just didn't happen. I stuck with it until the end. And at the end, I just thought, George, I trusted you and you let me down a little bit. I know people who just love this book so much. And so I think that I might need to just read it again. I hear you say so many times on the show, maybe it just wasn't the right time, you know, right book at the right time. And because I love George Saunders so much, I, I really do want, want to like it. But it just never really worked out for me. I love to see what people can do with the written word on the page. And in that mm. sense, it was absolutely fascinating. But also I read this early before there were critical reviews. I read it as an e-galley, sometimes e-galley files, the way the text displays on the page because it hasn't been formatted yet just looks weird. And when I sat down to read this with zero context, no critical reviews, I didn't even know what the book was about. I was like, there was something wrong with this copy. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> Cause I just didn't, it's so different and it's written almost like a play, but I didn't understand that. I'm like, why are there all these weird words that are not words? I mean, there were names, but I didn't know that. Like there was something wrong with this book. So I persisted and I like kind of figured out like, oh, this is just not at all what I expected. I think it's brilliant for the right reader. The audiobook production itself is fabulous uh, just because there's a whole host of different voices. And for some reason, like celebrity actors always voice George Saunders work. Not sure why that is, but it is. Like I just listened to the book with all the clauses I can't get in the right order. Is it a swim in the pond in the rain? It was really fun to listen to like Nick Offerman read me a Russian short story and do the voices. I think it's a great book for the right reader. You know, maybe the timing was wrong. Maybe it's not you. I think you could certainly appreciate it, but that doesn't mean that you're going to like relish the experience. Yeah, like I totally appreciated it for the same reason that I appreciated short stories, that it's just so innovative. It's so creative taking that specific incident in U.S. history and turning it into what he did. Like it is really creative and I think it's a cool idea. It just didn't work out for me. I'm glad to hear it didn't put you off him forever. You just picked up with the next thing. And I guess maybe to make up for it, if he had wanted to win you back, he wrote about the Russians for you. A Swim in the Pond in the Rain is just like everything that I could wish for in a book. <laughs> okay. Tell, re tell readers about it. How is that? It's got essays. It's got Russian literature. And it has that breaking the fourth wall personal connection. George Saunders reaches through the page and says hi to me and says, let's talk about some Russian literature together. That is a dream date if I ever heard one. <laughs> They're not necessarily some of the most famous Russian short stories, which is an interesting choice. There's some Russian short stories that probably wouldn't always get taught in Russian literature classes. Um, I had taken Russian literature and I hadn't heard about more than half of these. It's just really refreshing that he's trying to introduce these stories that otherwise might have just gotten lost. And so the structure of the book is each section is a short story and then George Saunders talking to you personally about it. And he'll say, right, what did you feel, you know, when the carriage was going through this part of the town? Why do you think they spent so much time talking about this contest rather than just getting to the contest already? Again, this is part of the reason it's really hard to sell essays to people is because I can imagine somebody saying, 
wow, Russian short stories being analyzed by a college professor. (laughs) Wow, snooze fest. Uh, But it's not. I'm reading this intentionally very slowly. I am trying to savor it like a treat. And I'll only read one. I'll try to do just one a week. So I haven't gotten to the end and I've had it for almost two months now. It is just so generous of him. I don't know what other word to use for it that he's just welcoming you into his brain and saying, here's a way to think about this. You don't have to, but if you think about it this way, this is a really powerful and interesting experience and story that that we can share and talk about together. And I imagine for many readers, it's a really fun MFA experience because he says, hey, thousands of students apply every year to come learn learn to write with me and Mary Carr at, at Syracuse. And 14 people have the spots and you're not going to come. So let me tell you what it's like. Those numbers aren't exactly right, but they are definitely enough in the range to give you the idea of how like, I'm not going to do that. But then he wrote me a book. (laughs) Exactly. And he wrote a book about stories that otherwise probably most people wouldn't read. And so he's introducing readers to this whole other genre in some ways. Reminded me, there was this Russian short story by Gogol that I had read in college, and I hadn't thought about it probably since college. I remembered it, and it was this great story about this really tragic character and I was like, God, that, there really is some great literature there. We only have so many hours in the day of things to read. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was really nice, though, that he did um, highlight this, this whole other section. It's still the whole other type of literature. And like Bird by Bird, he really picks it apart sometimes and says, this is why it works. Or sometimes he'll be like, yes. this part is a little weak and here is what it's missing. So if you appreciate thinking about why you love the books you love and what the authors are doing well, or maybe don't sometimes, it's, it's great to help you step back and think about the writing. So as a writer yourself, do you like reading books like that? Or does it kind of get in the way of your own process? Oh, I love it. It's my favorite way to procrastinate is to read about how to do the writing instead of actually doing the writing. Maybe that's what I've been doing all along. I say that I love it all not. It's like, I just really don't want to write that chapter. <laughs> you said you wrote 80,000 words. I mean, you got it done. You weren't spending all your time reading Anne Lamont. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Someone pointed that out to me by the end of writing something, particularly something that long. It's just exhausting. I mean, you've written multiple books. I've I've only written one, not public, even published it yet. But it's just like by the end, you're just tired, and I didn't want to. I don't want to look at it anymore. Heather, what else have you been reading lately? Uh, one other book that I read over the past month that I just loved is "Nobody Will Tell You This But Me." Oh, I'm glad to hear it. I adored everything about this book. Um, it's "Nobody Will Tell You This But Me" by Bess Cobb. It's really innovative in the way that it's written. So she writes it from the perspective of her grandmother, Bobby, who recently passed away and just tells a story about how her grandmother and grandfather met, about having kids. Um, But she also uses it to really reflect on her own relationship with her grandmother. The grandmother is just this, I mean, like 10 foot tall, amazing character. She's hilarious. I really wish that I could have dinner with her because she offers advice. She's really funny. She has these great stories. I mean, in some ways, it's just a really nice way that Beth Cobb honored her grandmother and talks about her family. But again, it's really personal and just tells these stories that a lot of people might not always want to talk about and just shows her own humanity Again, I wonder how she got her family to agree to some of the, to some of these stories. But this was just probably one of the best books that I read for all of the pandemic. It makes you feel like you got to know somebody, like you got to meet them. And the, the character Bobby is just so lovable. I love that you found it at the right time. Have you read this one? I have. I really enjoyed it. Because it's funny and touching and goes places you don't expect, but also the ones you hope she will. And it's, yeah, I thought it was lovely. I am pushing this book on everybody I know. Okay. So something that we both love about essay collections is that you can go anywhere. Like you can explore any subject, have any vicarious experience, any kind of tone, but we got to narrow it down to three. So Heather, with that in mind, tell me what you're looking for in your reading life right now. I would really like to try some more fiction, but in particular, I would like fiction that has that same 
um, experience of having a re- reliable narrator, somebody that you feel like you can trust where they're going to take you, they're going to take you to different places. Um, I find I really don't like fiction with an unreliable narrator who just throws me off halfway through. And so I, I don't care for narrators that will constantly change the perspective or just throw you for a loop halfway through. That's really not for me. I'm also looking for more um, diverse essay authors to find more of those writers that you come to feel like you know them, you can trust them, and for them to kind of take me on a different adventure. All right, Heather. So the books you loved were Trick Mirror by Gia Tolentino, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott, and Me Talk Pretty One Day by David Sedaris. Your deeply disappointing book was Lincoln and the Bardo by George Saunders. The book that wasn't right for you was Lincoln and the Bardo by George Saunders. As you describe everything you enjoy about a reading experience, it's really helpful to note that. The slots in with the picture I'm developing as you a reader. Recently, you have been reading more George Saunders, A Swim in the Pond in the Rain, and also Nobody Will Tell You This But Me by Bess Cobb. You're looking for more fiction, especially reliable narrators that feel like they're letting you into a world, albeit a fictional world, and also essays that just take you places that you haven't chosen for yourself yet. And I've been making notes. I got a list here and I, now I have to narrow it down. Oh, and this is the hardest part. I have to tell you, so many writing memoirs came to mind. I don't know. I don't really want to give you more to to read about writing instead of writing, knowing how dangerous that can be. Uh, so I think I'm going to back away from those. I would love to start with a novel that I think you could mistake for a memoir because it reads like that. It reads as the account of a woman telling you about her experience. It almost reads like a like a memoir or like you're reading somebody's journal. Does this sound like a good start to you? This sounds wonderful. Okay. It's about chickens. How does that sound? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> Um, this is a debut. It's called Brood. It's by Jackie Polson. It has a really beautiful cover that you might not realize at first are chicken feathers on the cover. This book takes place over the course of a single year. And you come to see that the narrator, whose name you don't know and never find out, um, though you do get to know the names of some of her friends and her husband, luckily. Oh, her husband's an academic. That could be interesting. And they're contemplating a big move depending on if he gets a job. And so there's a personal, not that you need it, but there's a personal connection to your own life. She lives in Minnesota. Um, The book takes place over the course of a year. So she goes through the Minnesota winter with these chickens who she says basically are not smart and bent on self-destruction. And it's my mission to keep them alive. And it's only going so well because chickens apparently don't want to be kept alive as much as she's trying to help them. But they, they go through terrible weather and 40 below nights because it's winter in Minnesota. And then it gets really hot in the summer and there's a tornado. And so she's very focused on these chickens and the chicken parts are very meditative. But you find out that she's also dealing with infertility and suffered a miscarriage that she's still processing. Her husband is contemplating a move. Her mother and her best friend are constantly sweeping in, offering observations and um, needed, but really fun, like funny moments. It's it's not exactly a slice of life book, but it's a really interesting, I can't call it a sliver instead. It's a really interesting way. What she does, she does what the essay collections do so well. She's talking about the chickens, which are her way into talking about life. And something she says that's really funny is like, when we talk about life, what are we talking, what are we talking about? We're talking about the ongoing efforts to live and to stay alive. And some people make that look effortless. Chickens, chickens don't. Let me tell you all the ways how. But but through the book, like through that lens, she's talking about her her own life and her own struggles and her own relationships. Meanwhile, her friend, the realtor and her husband, who her husband might be my favorite character. His name might be Percy or I might be making that up and getting it completely wrong. He's my favorite. How does that sound to you, Heather? This sounds wonderful. Chickens sound like a great distraction and break from nuclear weapons. (laughs) Now, let me tell you, and speaking to the listeners out there as well, as always, many readers found this to be the fascinating 
chicken raising deep dive they didn't know they wanted. And I wanted to give this book to everyone I know who raises chickens. Like that became a thing here about 20 years ago where it's something many people do in their backyards, including our friends who we've heard go like, ah, it's like they want the raccoons to come eat them. Like this is how they're acting. And some readers have been like, ah, nothing really happens. She's just thinking. But I think based on what you've said, that you're inclined to fall in the former camp and not the latter. Definitely. This sounds great. I am happy to hear it. Now I want to take off in that essay direction. How do you feel about something with a little more like serious intellectual tone? Sure. The book I'm thinking of is a Leila Lalame essay collection. It's called Conditional Citizens on Belonging in America. Is this an author or a work you're familiar with? I know the name, but I haven't heard of this um, essay collection. Sounds really interesting, though. Will loved her, I think, like 2014, 2015 novel, The Moore's Account. I've been meaning to read it for about that long. I really enjoyed her more recent, I think, 2019 novel, The Other Americans. But this is a new essay collection. It just came out last fall. She's Moroccan born. So she has a unique experience that she's writing from in this collection of essays that is about basically becoming and living as an American citizen. She was born in Morocco. She came to California for school. She met her husband there. And that is why she she needed to stay because they're going to get married. And they decided, you know, whose country do we go to? And for reasons she explains in the collection, um, the U.S. was the answer. And they wanted to stay in California. So I found that interesting right there. Like, oh, my, you've, you've fallen in love. And now one of you has to move halfway around the world. But being Moroccan born, she says, though this country that she has truly adopted and become a citizen in, though it prides itself on freedom and liberty, often she feels like her citizenship is conditional. And that depending on what's happening in the news or what's happening in her neighborhood, that she very quickly reverts in other people's eyes to either not or not really a true citizen. Even though she has legally obtained full citizenship, she isn't fully accepted into American society. And she is one of scads of people who are experiencing exactly this. So she shares interesting encounters um, at work, in her family. Uh, I think there's one on an airplane. I know you said you used to pay attention to the bookers. She is an American Book Award winner. But she's bringing her perspective as a Moroccan-born Muslim immigrant to your favorite genre. How does that sound? This sounds absolutely perfect, especially as someone who just moved back to the U.S. And I will confess, I'm feeling quite a bit of reverse culture shock. And so I can't say that I'll relate to it, obviously, as she's a Moroccan woman. But this just sounds really wonderful and absolutely perfect. I'm happy to hear it. That is Conditional Citizens on Belonging in America by Leila Lalami. And finally, I think we want to take you someplace that's thoughtful, but also fun. Because you said about, you know, your best friend, Anne, and David Sedar. Actually, you said about Gia Tolentino, too, that they're funny. Like, maybe they're not making you laugh where you wake people up sleeping on airplanes, but they are funny. And I want to bring you some of that humor. Are you here for that? I am very here for that. Okay. The book I'm hoping you haven't read yet is by R. Eric Thomas. It's called Here For It or How to Save Your Soul in America. I have been wanting to read this book for ages and my library never has it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, we're going to go with it then. Here's why I think it's right for you. So you like collections that are personal, that welcome you in to the writer's mind. They invite you to come out on a walk or sit down for a cup of tea. Metaphorically speaking, of course, no matter what that Boston bookseller thinks about Anne Lamott. So this is a heartfelt, considered, but also he's really funny. I mean, he's a storyteller and a humorist. He wrote a hysterical column at Elle for years called Eric Reads the News, I think. But this is uh, definitely memoirish because he's sharing stories about growing up and coming of age, like from his early years to adulthood. And he's just so disarmingly hilariously honest. And he writes about things like discovering his identity and feeling like an outsider because he grew up at home in a very religious family, conservative family that didn't have a lot of money. And he's black. That's important. And then he went to this really rich, white, I think he describes it as verdant or some similarly garden-like word, high school and how that was constantly head spinning to go back and forth between the two 
worlds. And he talks about finding his voice while he was feeling like an outsider and having to figure out like, (laughs) if my experiences are so different, who am I? But as he writes, because of what he does and because of what he's interested in, he injects these hilarious pop culture references throughout his writing. He's just really funny. This is the kind of author like David Sedaris who can make you laugh and cry on the full page or on the same page. You may notice that I'm often really drawn to the relational aspects that people are writing about an essay. Mm. I mean, I love to read about something like, I don't know, jellyfish or crickets as well. (laughs) But also, also, I really enjoy hearing about the relational aspects. He is married to a Presbyterian minister. They got married back in the mid 2010s. Oh, there's so much great material there. There's so there's so much drama involved in going to church as he does to support his spouse. And I just, yeah, laughing and crying. So how does that sound to you? It's been on your library list. How does that sound? This sounds so great. I can't wait to read it. I have been trying not to buy more books so that I don't keep accumulating these like continents of books. But this one, I think I'm I think it might I think I might just have to buy it. Are you an audiobook listener, Heather? I've tried it a few times and it it wasn't really for me. For those who are he narrates his audiobook. It's for for like maximum humorous potential. That's highly recommended. I might give that a try along with the David Sedaris as an audiobook. It would definitely lighten my suitcases, um, but also might just be even funnier. Well, I'd be curious to hear how that goes. And also, I'm curious to hear what you're going to choose next. So of the books we talked about today, they were the novel Brood by Jackie Polson, Conditional Citizens by Leila Lalami, and Here for It or How to Save Your Soul in America by R. Eric Thomas. Heather, of those books, what do you think you'll read next? I'll probably start with Conditional Citizens. That just sounds like everything that I love in the essay with that personal experience, storytelling aspect to it, but also that it does have kind of more serious social commentary uh, going on as well. That one just sounded really fascinating to hear about an immigrant's experience. But these all sound so wonderful. Thank you, Anne. It is my pleasure. Um, I'm glad to hear it. I hope you love them. And thanks so much for talking books with me today. Thank you. Hey, readers, I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Heather, and I'd love to hear what you think she should read next. That page is at what should I read next podcast.com slash 281. And it's where you will find the full list of titles we talked about today. Subscribe now so you don't miss next week's episode in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and more. We'll see you next week. To support our show in a tangible way and get weekly bonus episodes, access to our upcoming summer reading guide unboxing, and peeks behind the scenes, join our Patreon community at patreon.com slash what should I read next. Sign up to become a supporter at patreon.com slash what should I read next. Follow us on Instagram at what should I read next. And if you don't get our weekly newsletter, Go to what should I read next podcast.com slash newsletter to sign up for our free weekly delivery. Thanks to the people who make the show happen. What should I read next is produced by Brenna Frederick with sound design by Kellen Pekacek. Readers, that's it for this episode. Thanks so much for listening. And as Reiner Maria Rilke said, ah, how good it is to be among people who are reading. Happy reading, everyone. <laughs>